We're live. Hey guys, welcome to the revamped TVNweather.com podcast, Never Stop Chasing. Uh, sorry I've been gone for a while. Uh, we've been chasing on Christmas Day, uh, trying to finish up the dissertation. Uh, lots of obligations, but uh, 2013 is here. We survived, thank God. I uh, chased uh, 2012 like it was the last chase season because we thought the end of the world was coming, so we gave it everything we had. Uh, we survived in 2013. And one of the initial products that we're rolling out here at TVN uh, that's totally revamped is our podcast. You can see we got the new set. Uh, we've got Skyping capabilities, so we're going to bring in some, some heavy hitter guests, uh, some really interesting guys in the scientific community, as well as media, engineering. And uh, we're going to be doing this podcast. We'll try to do it every week, uh, and it's not at a set date. That's the beauty of a podcast. It's different than a radio show. We can launch it any day of the week that we want. Uh, today we launched at 5 o'clock. We're launching a little bit early because we'll have the archives up. We'll promote those. So if you can't see it live, uh, you're not watching it now, but <laughs> you'll be watching the archive later on. And uh, we'll also be taking questions through Twitter at Reed Timmer at TVN, uh, or at Reed Timmer TVN, and also through the player on the podcast. And we've got a very special guest today. Uh, he's someone I trust my life with. Uh, to build a vehicle, to drive into tornadoes. And uh, I'll tell you what, uh, it takes the ultimate trust to take an untested vehicle uh, that's designed to drive into a tornado. And basically, I'm putting my, lives, my, my life in the hands uh, of this man. And uh, I'll let Dick introduce him. Hey, guys. Uh, we've got Kevin Barton uh, and Rob Barton and the Dominator of 3 build team today. Um, Kevin's actually designing, and his build team are actually designing uh, Dominator 3 right now. So, uh, yeah. Welcome to the show, guys. How you doing? Good. And Kevin is live from the garage up in Michigan. Uh, that's Kevin and the build team. And uh, that's, that's our good friend Benny Christie over there. Uh, we all used to work at the golf course uh, together. That's how, that's how we met. Uh, before I got into storm chasing, uh, I was mowing grass over at a, a golf course in Michigan. And I'll tell you what, there's no better job than painting a straight line with a fairway mower and then forgetting to press the lift button and taking out the rough. Uh, I know Ben, uh, Ben, he was the uh, mechanic there, still is. Uh, Kevin was a superintendent at another golf course. And uh, Ben and I, we have a lot of stories uh, from those days that we probably can't share on a podcast and don't have anything to do with weather. Uh, I do remember making weather bets with you guys, though. Remember that, Benny, when uh, I'd say there was going to be a severe weather that was going to knock all the trees down in the golf course. I'd Bet five dollars, everybody that would happen, and you know, I obviously lost. But there was one bet uh, that I made toward the end of uh, my my tenure there at the golf course, and that was uh, the 1999 into 2000 season. Uh, OU was unranked. Uh, Bob Stoops' the second season, and I bet everybody at the golf course like I could ten to one odds. I said OU is going to win the national championship in 2000. And the only bet that I won, I never got paid out. So, Benny, uh, you guys still owe me on that one. But, yeah, they're live from the uh, Freeport Garage, and that's the Dominator 3 uh, building behind them. And uh, we're partnering with TVN Canada chaser uh, Sean Schofer. Uh, you can follow him at Sean Schofer TVN. Uh, you can also go to his Facebook fan page, and his last name is S-C-H-O-F-E-R. He's been posting Dominator 3 build videos. And uh, basically, I'll give you a rundown on what we plan to do with the Dominators, first of all. Uh, you know, we've been getting close well, to tornadoes for, a lot, for our whole lives, right? I mean, I, we started Chase with an 85 Plymouth Reliant and a 1991 Mercury Topaz. I uh, had a Chevy Lumina covered with duct tape in there that you know, drove 25,000 miles, and it blew up near the Kansas border. Uh, and then, you know, we got good at getting close to tornadoes, but... We've always been obsessed with the science. You know, so, we, we wanted a way to safely get inside a tornado, and we needed to find someone as crazy as us to take on the project. And uh, the only guy that we knew to build it was Ben Christie over there, the uh, mechanic at the golf course, because they used to build race cars for the dirt tracks uh, up in Michigan. And he introduced us to Kevin, and uh, the meeting went from there. And uh, Kevin trusted us that we'd come through on our end, and I trusted Kevin that he'd come through on his end. And the way the Dominator worked is we wanted something the opposite of an airplane wing. We wanted a, you know, an airplane wing, airplane flies because it has a wing with a flat bottom and a rounded overside. And through what's called Bernoulli effect, the wind is forced up and over the wing at a faster rate than it is to go under. That causes lift. 
and we want to minimize lift. And so all I approached Kevin with, with was we needed a vehicle that could drop flush to the ground and eliminate the wind underneath and just have the wind going up and over, eliminate that lift. And that's all Kevin had to go by, and he let it rip. So. And Kevin, uh, when did you come up with this idea? I mean, did, when did Reed approach you? You know, What year was that? Was that 2008, 2009? Yeah, I was at a bar actually in Michigan. And it, Kevin, what did you think the first time you, you, you met up with us? Did you think, who are these freaks? You know, I mean, you had a, sol you had a solid job, and uh, you know, we, we approached you with this, and um, you pretty much you know, put your li livelihood in the hands of, the hands of us. Well, initially, I got a phone call from Ben here, and, and he said, that, hey, you want to do a winter project? And, and I said, well, it depends on what it is. And he said, uh, you want to build a storm chasing car for Reed Timmer? And I said, uh, what? <laughs> and I said, I, I really didn't have the first idea what we would actually do. And I, I think my initial reaction was no. And, and we <laughs> a little bit, and I thought, well, I'll at least meet and talk with him and, and see what he's got to say. And so one thing led to another, I think that was in August, wasn't it? When we first, it was like August when we first talked on the phone. And then we finally met up, I, I believe it was uh, November, uh, somewhere in November. Uh, calendar months don't matter. It's all one big storm season, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, can't, I can't remember the exact dates, but uh, we met up with you up in Grand Rapids and sat down and had a couple beers and just talked over ideas and, uh, somewhere in that time period, I'd, I'd come up with a, an idea of putting hydraulics on the car to drop it. Um, and I think that was probably the one thing that, that kind of sparked the whole project. That Once we had that idea in our head, then we, we really thought we could move forward with it. And obviously, you liked the idea, so <laughs> yeah, it just kind of sprung from there. Well, tell us about the dream that you had, because it all came from a dream, right? You uh, woke up in the middle of the night and had an epiphany and then drew something down on a sticky pad uh, next to the bed, and there it was, right? <laughs> sticky note? Well, something like that. Yeah, I actually I was going over in my head how I would do the hydraulics on the car and uh, just had the idea in the middle of the night. So I ran downstairs and, and drew it out, and uh, then, of course, uh, that initial drawing was actually pretty close to what we ended up doing, but when we got back and when I got out to the garage and, and showed that to, to Ben and Rob, then we all just started tweaking on the idea and it, and that's but basically that's how it came together. Uh, the the initial design is pretty close. I think I still have the drawing somewhere. How how long did it take you guys to build a Dominator one? When did you guys start? Uh, you know, and uh, how long did it take you to get finished? It was right around. It was right around 12 weeks. Um, we, I think we started January 7th, and we drove it out to Oklahoma in uh, I think like the 4th of April. So nice. It was. Uh, we didn't think we were going to get done. Honestly, it didn't have skirting on it yet when we drove it out to Oklahoma. But did it ever really get done me. though? Is the, the question? I mean, we always get it done at the last second. But <laughs> but Kevin would be given like a month or two to build. A tornado chasing yeah. tank that looks like the Batmobile, and that was incredible. And I mean, uh, yeah. How, how long did you guys, I mean, spend each day? I mean, you guys working eight-hour days, you working sixteen-hour days to get this uh, thing done? I was in, I was in the shop from from six, seven in the morning until nine, ten at night, pretty much every day during Dom One build. Uh, luckily, Rob was on third shift at the time, so he was able to work with me during the day, and then Ben would come in at night. And, and join up with me so we really uh, it was a pretty good team effort there plus we had uh, Ben's dad Ben senior out here pretty much full-time so and he helped out quite a bit we got a funny story for you I mean uh, <clears throat> you know when I for after our first season we just had the regular Tahoe and uh, this you know, 2007 was a good storm season you know I'd live tornado to tornado started off selling video by payphone and uh, you know, I had a great year in 2003, uh, you know, blew it all on a girlfriend. I uh, had a bad year in 2004 when we roll, rolled our car in a sewage ditch. Uh, didn't have a vehicle there for a few years. And, uh, <laughs> but actually you know, going into uh, the first vehicle that I bought that was worth over about $500 was this Chevy Tahoe. It was a 2008 Chevy Tahoe, brand new back then. Plan was to start a tour company. And uh, we get a call from Discovery and we went through the first season and, uh, I t you know, we saw the, the TIV, you know, and, and we figured, you know, let's do this for science. You know, we, we've been, I've intercepted tornadoes underneath the Hyundai Accent, you know, accidentally, you know, on foot. 
uh, we've been, we're good at getting close to tornadoes, so you know, let's use this as an opportunity to do our science. And our goal is to try to get inside the tornado and use high resolution radar to try to measure the wind speeds in those suction vortices or the multiple vortices that spin around the tornadoes that could have wind speeds gusting five or 600 miles per hour, possibly approaching the speed of sound. At least that's my theory is they spin up well, to the speed of sound well, and, and break up into turbulence. And so, but the funny thing about Discovery is that she said, no, you're not building a vehicle, you know, because they didn't want to put forth the money. So I put forth every, every savings I had in my own pocket. I said, Kevin, this is what we got. Here's a brand new Tahoe. Uh, what can you do? Can you turn it into a vehicle? And I think Kevin trusted us right away because I just gave him the keys to my, my Tahoe and said, let it rip. And he uh, cut that thing apart. Yeah. And next thing I know, here's the vehicle. But hey, Kevin, tell, tell him the story about when the executive producer called you because we weren't allowed to intercept tornadoes. I told her we're building you know, this vehicle to get close, just up, just up close. Mm -hmm. I never told that to Kevin. I said, you know, design something to get right in the heart of this thing because obviously that's where we're going with it. So... Kevin, tell, tell, tell them the story about when the executive producer called you. <laughs> well, yeah, Reed never, Reed never told me, uh, you know, that I was supposed to be uh, discreet about that. And, but he never really told me either that he was going to intercept a tornado. He did initially tell me that he wanted to build uh, what, well, what became the Dominator. It wasn't, dom wasn't called the Dominator when we first started building that We had no idea what we were going to call it. But uh, he just told me he needed it to withstand like 130, 120, 130 mile an hour wind. I 170, thought, well, 200. <laughs> that wouldn't be too bad, you know. Well, then the executive producer of the production company calls, the executive producer of the show, and she says, well, I said, well, we have to build this thing so it can withstand, you know, a direct hit from tornado. And she says, well, no, he's not going to, uh, he's not going to intercept tornado. He's just going to get close and i just started laughing i mean <laughs> literally on the phone i started laughing i said you don't know Reed very well <laughs> that's you know, hilarious then, uh we hung up and a few minutes later it was like oh yeah, okay Reed calls me and <laughs> don't say that uh, <laughs> you know well the funny thing is, is yeah that, that 2009 season i mean you know we didn't have the uh you know paperwork in place we weren't allowed to intercept mm -hmm. And uh, Joel's with us at first, Jason. We've got Joel in the house yeah, right Joel's now. Here. He's standing over here. He'll be stepping Stretch in to uh, talk about some stories uh, later on. There was an intercept with Dominator 1 that Kevin had. Yeah, we had two Dominators out in the field, but Discovery only covered Dominator 2. It was the 2011 season. And the craziest intercept. I mean, this <laughs> thing makes the window blow out in uh, 2009 with the Aurora, Nebraska tornado. It makes that look like summer camp. I mean, a horse hit the vehicle, what and Dominator yeah. 1 survived. It was June 20th, 2011. We overshot the tornado a little bit. I got stuck in the you mud. got stuck in the mud. And uh, we'll talk about that story later. But in 2009, uh, I roll up and uh, to see the Dominator for the first time, and I wanted to make the vehicle gold, like metallic gold. <laughs> I proposed that to the executive producer. She's like, no way. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I mean, the metallic gold would just end up looking like mustard colored or, yeah. or brown. Anyway, I mean, it would look really weird. Uh, so, you know, we made it bright red. We want, that's, you know, we're, we're extreme. What's more extreme than bright red? And we get there, and the thing rolls out. And, I mean, it, it looks like a, a, a cross between a tomato and the Batmobile. I mean, it was bright <laughs> red. I had to wear sunglasses, but I loved it. And we showed it to the executive producer. And she's like, whoa. You know, I mean, you use these cameras, it would just blow out. It would be insane. Oh. And so, remember, Kevin, she had to spray paint the whole entire thing, like, well, first of all, crimson OU colors, but then it kind of turned into this, like, rusty kind of brownish color, you know, as we went on, but that kind of fit in well with the whole OU theme, right? I mean, I know Dick's a Texas fan with an OU uh, yeah. logo behind him. So, but how did, uh, I mean, did, did it, would you originally call it the Dominator? I mean, how did that name come into play? Uh, well, actually, it came because uh, there was this thing that we, we wanted to fly UAVs, you know, into, into tornadoes and hurricanes, and there's this thing called the Dominator that uh, so the military or somebody is using with all these, like, all kinds of bombs and stuff over it. And so I proposed it as a joke, you know, kind of like, I was like, hey, how about the Dominator? And next thing I know, it's all over coffee, coffee cups, T-shirts, like, <laughs> the whole show, I did, you know, dominate, 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 dominating. And, I mean, honestly, when I hear the word dominating now, it, you know, it, it <laughs> I get break out into a sweat. But, yeah, it's, it's one of those jokes that, you know, I have OCD, so we'll start off with a joke, and then we'll run it into the ground. But it kind of became serious, you know, and yeah. sometimes we dominate the storm, but 
we've had the storm dominate us. And in 2009, we didn't even test this thing. I mean, we took it out in the field, and Joel was driving first. It was April 26. Uh, this was Kevin's first tornado. And uh, I'll let Kevin talk about this story from kind of an outside perspective because it was his first tornado, and he's driving up to it. I mean, this thing came from the trees from the right. You couldn't really see it, but it was like this stovepipe, perfect intercept. We're driving up into it. First time with a Dominator, April 26, 2009. Kevin's right behind us, and Kevin, you must have been pretty fired up. Uh, yeah, I was, <laughs> I wouldn't say fired up. I was freaked out, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> saw it come down right next to the road, probably, well, I don't know, a couple hundred yards away from us. And from my perspective, looking up at the top of that hose, I thought it was going to come right down on the truck. So it was, <laughs> it was an amazing, just beautiful white stovepipe tornado, and uh, driving alongside of it, really, at like 60 miles an hour, following these guys and watching the Dominator up ahead, and I could see it angling toward the road, and I thought, man, it's going to hit them directly on our first time out. And uh, it passed probably 20 feet in front of them. Yeah, uh, what was, happened to Joel that day? It was just incredible, and the, the video from it speaks for itself. But yeah. that Joel was hit a the brakes. Spectacular, uh, <laughs> Uh-oh, we got the rivalry going, the Dick versus Joel rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> Joel hit the brakes. I would have just gunned it right into that thing. <laughs> but then later on, Joel did intercept an EF4 that caused us to slide across the ground yeah. get there, and then Dick intercepted an EF4. <laughs> but then maybe I should step out and have Dick and Joel go at it <laughs> about that. But... Hey, hey, Kevin, you mind you mind telling our viewers, the ones that don't know, uh, what the Dominator 1 was uh, originally made out of and what are the specs and all that type of stuff? Yeah, talk about all the engineering. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, uh, let's uh, let the Kevin Barton uh, storytelling. Like, just tell uh, all the ins and outs, the engineering of the vehicle, what went into it. Um, There's a lot of people that want to know, you know, what the uh, original. And this thing is built out of a garage that is very small. I mean, it's smaller than my garage. I don't know how they, it's heated with like a, a stove in there, you know, and they're I mean, barely enough room to move around. And how they built this Dominator in that small garage is amazing. I mean, they worked. They're machines, and yeah. uh, you know, I would trust my life in the hands of those guys any day. I mean, uh, I did with Benny anyway. I mean, uh, but Benny rigged a lawnmower one time, and I was driving mowing tees, and the, the oil thing blew up. And when those oil lines blow up, I mean, they could be you know enough, you know, hot enough temperature to like you know mm -hmm. burn your skin off. So I'm mowing a tee box that Benny you know fixed this uh, lawnmower for me. The thing blew up. I had glasses on. <laughs> covered my whole face with oil and i thought my skin was burning off i'm like what? <laughs> freaking out run back full speed you know back to the warehouse you know and benny's standing there i've covered in oil and thankfully my skin was okay but still i trust benny to design a uh, a vehicle to drive into a tornado what do you, what do you think about that benny uh yeah it's a little different than a, a tornado vehicle but that lawnmower did did hose me down with oil didn't it <laughs> if so, it was one different line that. if it yeah, was a different i mean i started a geyser at the golf course too that benny had to take care of i mean trying to fix a sprinkler you know and like one false mistake it was a geyser that looked like you know old faithful going like 100 <laughs> yards into the air and i mean there were a lot of stories at the golf course but anyway getting back on yeah track. hey kevin so uh yeah what was what's, what's dominator one built out of i mean what's what makes it special well we started the project. We honestly never envisioned what ended up uh, what it ended up looking like. I mean, uh, here's a little, uh, just a quick picture of uh, this was the day it rolled out of the shop and headed for Oklahoma. Nice. But uh, it wasn't really finished. But <laughs> um, we initially were just going to build some roll cage inside, uh, just change out the windows, change out the glass to polycarbonate so it wouldn't, we wouldn't have any window shatter, <clears throat> things like that. And when, when we started uh, looking at the inside of the vehicle, and this was a relatively new vehicle, uh, 2008, and, and we were, you know, just the beginning of 2009 when we started it. And um, we were looking inside, and we were looking at, like, side curtain airbags and and all the front airbags and stuff. There are a lot of safety features in that vehicle anyway, and we didn't want to put a roll cage in front of the airbags and create a, you know, a worse situation. And I think Rob and I were driving up to uh, Grand Rapids to pick up some supplies for it, and it's, I don't know which one of us thought of it. We just said, well, let's put the roll cage on the outside. And when as soon as that hit, then the whole plan changed. We, we 
started building the roll cage around the exterior of the vehicle. And then that gave us a mounting point to put on uh, 16 gauge steel over the outside to armor it and, or, you know, basically protect it against debris. And it gave us a place to put uh, exterior polycarbonate windows. And it, it just snowballed from there. Initially, I think the thing would have probably looked like a, a, a Chevy Tahoe with hydraulics on it. Uh, but as it turned out, when it, you know, we put the roll cage on the outside, started armoring it, and it started taking a shape. So then we started thinking, well, we could take this shape and make it aerodynamic so that the wind would pass over it easier. And with the hydraulics, we could skirt the bottom and keep all the wind from getting underneath. It would really withstand, you know, pretty good wind speed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how the that's how the shape and all that got started. Um, but as far as the science behind it, really, we just looked at what we did with race cars. Um, so what did uh, what Cindy Barton? Obviously, she's you know involved in our operation a lot now. I know she helps you run the tours. Like she's run, running a lot of parts. <laughs> I mean, all facets of TVN now. What did what did she think about this whole project right off the bat? Was she <laughs> on board or was she like, what are you doing, Kevin? These guys are nuts. <laughs> Well, actually, uh, no, she really was on board. Uh, she she kind of found it interesting, I think, you know. Uh, she wasn't, I don't think any of them really had envisioned what we were going to build. And um, it started off as, as just such a simple project. It's like, okay, yeah, we're going to armor it a little bit and make simple. it a little tougher. Well, then it turned into this, this monster. And, you know, on the other the other side of it, I had just had, you know, like major back surgery a month before. <laughs> when I started building the Dominator, I was still in a back brace. I couldn't even, couldn't really? even get down That's onto the floor to do any of the work. That's dedication right uh, there. But I actually think that helped me uh, rehab. Honestly, building that thing uh, probably helped me more than anything. But, but yeah, she was behind it. I think from the beginning, I don't think she realized what it was going to look like uh, until we started putting the cage on the outside. But I think that's what makes TVN so unique is that everybody has passion. And, you know, that's one thing is that whether it's passion for tornadoes, but the passion for tornadoes may have brought us all together. But, you know, we've got Seth, whose passion is computer programming. We've got Chris Whiteneck, whose passion is the shooting and production side of things. We've got Ken, whose passion is the editing. We've got Dick, whose passion is storm chasing and driving from, you know, Seattle to Orlando and back again. We've got Joel that I've storm chased with forever. Uh, passion is storm chasing, and uh, I think that's you know kind of what finds us. <laughs> and, uh, well, we may be bringing Joel back here in 2013. He, uh, Joel just needed a year off, and it sounds like he's coming back, and we'll have a couple dominators, maybe three out in the field, and uh, could have a little competition between Joel and Dick. But in 2009, I got this vehicle, and it was a magical year. I think 2009 is a year like we'll never have before because – uh, you know, Joel wanted to, he left the team for a while. You know, I think the, the production side of things, like, uh, kind of caused some problems because we had to chase everything. And normally we would just kind of chase when we felt like it. it was very organic and just two friends out there chasing storms and the show added a different dimension. But, you know, I was on a mission to intercept tornadoes and uh, it came down to basically just me driving the vehicle and uh, someone else in the passenger seat that uh, would, you know, be along for the ride. And, uh, and the help I was shooting, and <clears throat> it was crazy because I remember being so focused on getting that vehicle in the path of the tornado that I never thought the worst case scenario could happen. I never thought we could die. I never thought anything. I just remember seeing the tornado in the windshield, hitting the gas pedal, and this whole entire tingling feeling would take over my body. And that was mm -hmm. obviously the adrenaline. But, I mean, there's nothing like it when you park in the path of a tornado. And the first direct intercept we had, the real direct, uh, was June 5th. Uh, 2009, yeah, LaGrange, Wyoming, and it was a rope as it was approaching us, and Dave Holder was driving, uh, he does our ExtremeTornadoTours.com, now he runs it, with and, Kevin. Uh, yeah, with Kevin, uh, we had Chris in the back, and uh, we're blasting south, and, uh, and I look over at Dave, and he looked like a deer in headlights, it did not look <laughs> like he was stopping, and I said, hey Dave, we gotta pull over now, and there was still nothing, I thought we were bypassing this rope, and I was like, Dave, we gotta pull over now. And then freaked out even more, and they cut this out of Storm Chasers because my face looked so insane because, like, my face gets so crazy, even though I don't mean it that way. I was like, Dave, we got to pull the flip over now. <laughs> and finally, we come to a screeching halt, and thankfully, the tornado turned to the right, and we had a direct hit. Uh, Chris in the back was bracing himself with, a, you know, with his feet. 
I remember Dave looking over the left, wrapping himself <laughs> up in the seatbelt, and I was just looking over mesmerized by this vortex coming, but it never crossed my mind that this thing could kill us. Like, uh, I don't know why, but something about 2009, it never crossed my mind. And when that first wind gust hit the vehicle, it felt like a freight train. I mean, it went from totally calm to bam. Like, yeah. like And we measured 155.2 mile per hour wind in that, and it was what? a rope, so it was quick. And as it went by... I couldn't see out the right side of the vehicle. The whole right side of the vehicle was covered with tumbleweeds. And I can't describe you the feeling of intercepting a tornado directly, feeling your ears pop, mm -hmm. feeling the power, looking off to the east, knowing the vehicle's still on the ground, knowing that Kevin's all fired up, that his vehicle survived uh, EF3 intensity winds. And it's just such a team effort. And, like, you know, there's no I in team. And, mission uh, mission accomplished. Everybody right came together with their individual talents and, but I'll tell you what, I've gotten more and more scared every single <laughs> intercept. And with that little tornado so beautiful coming at us, this translucent yeah. vortex with tumbleweeds going around, it looks so harmless and beautiful, and it's small and a rope. But the rope tornadoes can be the most dangerous because yeah. when you stretch it like that, mm -hmm. they can get more intense. It's like Stronger a figure winds. skater pulling yep. in their arms and spinning faster. And I'd be much more inclined to intercept a wedge tornado with really low cloud bases than a rope tornado with a high cloud base because it requires that lower pressure fall to get condensation and you get stronger wind speeds mm -hmm. with the ropes. And that ended up being the strongest, at least horizontal wind speed that we measured inside a tornado. And the whole reason we built the Dominators was to deck it out with instruments. And we had a radar, an X-band mobile radar to measure the vertical winds. We had the anemometer on the Dominator to measure horizontal winds. Uh, and then eventually we added the air cannon system to shoot parachute probes inside to fly around. Uh, we had our 12-foot wingspan aircraft, and 2009 was a magical year. And then after that... It was too bad you didn't have me for that uh, intercept. I probably could have got the follow shot of you guys getting hit by that. June 17th? Uh, June... No, I got the follow shot of you on June 17th, June 5th of LaGrange Day. Well, tell us about June 17th. June 17th, yeah, I just... <clears throat> Um, Darren Brewer and I, who have been chasing for a long time, he actually uh, uh, steers the, uh, the TIV team uh, for the last few years, uh, getting the shots for them. But uh, we were actually chasing uh, storms in north central Kansas and then noticed uh, you know, the storms were going to get fire in south central Nebraska, so we hauled butt over there and uh, got on the uh, Aurora tornado in Grand Island and uh, busted east, and then all of a sudden, Darren's outside. He's like, oh, it's, it's forming, you know, right when it's forming on the ground. And uh, he's like, it's on the ground. And, and all of a sudden, it's coming right at us as it's forming. And we didn't know it at the time, but there's a really high base funnel. So he's like, he's like, it's coming right at us. It's going to come right at us. And he kneels down as the vortex, you know, the first uh, spin up yeah. hits it, like rocks my car. And he intercepts that thing on foot as your, as your dominator is going passing at the same time. So you guys actually yeah. intercepted it. You know, more than one time. And the weird thing about the, then, that day is there are such high base yeah. tornadoes that are weak. And, I mean, I had my head out the window looking straight up at this nipple funnel. Mm, I didn't even week. know that was yeah. there. And we were, we were probably like 200 yards away. And then all of a sudden, uh, Tim Samaras, uh, right after you guys intercepted that there, Tim Samaras pulled up in behind. But, yeah, we got you guys. Uh, I remember, like, uh, you running up to me. Well, no, like, no, well, you pulled up. Remember, the, the yeah. tornado, the base dropped. Like, yeah. suddenly, we, this is the worst-case scenario. And we were overconfident that year and thought they were all high base. We'd intercepted all these yeah. high base funnels. And suddenly, we're inside this tornado. And this is the only time that I thought we were in trouble because it intensified with us in it. it mm -hmm. I remember suddenly seeing dirt going all the way around a circle. I remember my ears popping like there's no tomorrow. How did you know how to turn? Like, uh, well, you know that video of you turning as the windows shattered? I just I saw the suction vortex form really? on the left, and you could see the suction vortex coming. And ironically, that's what we're trying to measure, and that's what ended up blowing out the window. Mm -hmm. But in the back seat, Chris Whiteneck looked over at Mick Wimbro, who was our radar engineer. And even before the window blew out, he had a stream of blood coming out of his ear. And Chris Whiteneck was like, Mick, your ear's bleeding. And he's like, what? And it was because his sinuses were clogged, and, it, and the pressure fall oh. blew out his eardrum. And he went to a doctor after that, and they said that's an injury that a lot of times they see in pilots flying at high altitude because the pressure fall that drives the wind speed does that. And I remember my ears popping, and I thought we were going to be inside a wedge, and it was basically stationary. And the vehicle's rocking back and forth. And that thing just grew like that. And we didn't have time to get the Lexan windows up because back then they were manual. So you lift them up manually, and latch. Mm -hmm. And I'll say that they got stuck on record. But to tell you <laughs> the truth, 
they worked fine. Uh, it was just <laughs> overconfidence. And uh, I had the window open inside that tornado, and I rolled up the regular glass window, and I see this suction vortex coming right out. It's had a pressure wave on the ground. You can see it in the video. I remember hearing, like, hearing that. And when that thing hit, the window blew out. And I remember like looking, but when your adrenaline's going, the time, like, one second seems like 30. Oh, I know. So you could look out and see the suction vortex, and right before it hit, just looked away, and then, boom, the glass shattered. The first thing I thought was, I've got glass in my eyes. You know, I put my hand up to my face, and there's blood everywhere. I look over at Chris. He's bleeding. Got hit by a dinner plate-sized piece, piece of hail. Uh, patted him on the back. He's like, you're, you're... I was like, we did it, we did it. He's like, stop it. You're pushing glass into my back. <laughs> and uh, then he almost passed out uh, because of the sight of blood. Uh, he almost passed out, but we kept chasing. And they cut it out of storm chasers because we kept chasing yeah, the tornado. I remember coming up to you. Blood all over. I've never seen you. Like, you like you've seen a ghost, and you're just like, Dick. You, like, run up to me, like, is my eye okay? And you got all this blood over you. And you're like, yeah, you're fine. You're like, what happened? You're just, like, totally, like, in, like, I don't know, la-la land. Well, like, I sprinted it, it over so to. so shocked, I think. S- sprinted over to Tim Samaritan. Yeah, Star, I remember that, too. Adrenaline <laughs> caused you just to sprint in random directions. But then the two days before that, and this is another funny story, and then we'll get to the upgrades uh, and, 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 and how uh, Kevin fixed these issues. But it was June 15, 2009. Uh, this is two days before the window blowout. We're in perfect position on this tornado. You saw this tornado as well, Dick. Uh, and Dick wasn't uh, driving the production vehicle, the follow vehicle yet, but <clears throat> we're driving east. We see this strong tornado formed to the right, and it's coming right at us. And we're trying to get in position on these muddy roads. You know, we're about to intercept. And the thing lifts, moves right over us, and then plants to the northeast and grew to a very strong tornado. And I've never seen a tornado do this, but the thing got bigger and bigger. And I wasn't sure if it was just getting bigger and moving away or coming back at us. So I look in the back seat at Chris Whiteneck, you know, who's L.A. camera guy, first time intercepting tornadoes. And I look at him, and I'm like, Chris, is that coming back at us? And when that happened, I saw his eyes get about as big as half dollars. And he's like, heck, yes, it's coming back at us. And so I used the microphone to talk to the radio system in the production vehicle. I'm like, guys, we got to back up. We got to back up. And we put the car in reverse, and we're going full speed. I'm just assuming they hear us. And this tornado is coming right at us. And then I hear this little horn go off, and <laughs> boom, slammed into the production vehicle full speed. Uh, and this tornado is coming at us. I thought we were done. And thankfully, it weakened just yeah. before it hit us, and we get out. And the Dominator, you know, there's not a scratch in the production vehicle. But the back end of the Dominator that Kevin you know, hadn't, didn't have time to finish yet, it was just like a flat plate, was pushed in like a huge, massive really? dent. But that window blowout, that event, uh, all motivated improvements. And also that event, if you notice, almost every single video, uh, Chris, our extreme camera guy, uh, he always screams, it's coming back at us when the tornadoes <laughs> are. <laughs> it is, it's always something to consider. But... Kevin, with all the, those, you know, science goes wrong all the time when you're doing, you know, when you're pioneering things and doing fringe science. And uh, it's take, hard. It's hard to get inside of a tornado too. People think it's just you just drive up to the, you know, like there's a tornado on the ground, you just drive right up to it. There's a lot of, you know, it's really hard to do. And there's a lot of luck. I mean, the first yeah. tornado I intercepted was with Dave Holder. We were in a Hyundai Accent, or in Minnesota, June 29, 2005. That video. It was like a high base funnel. You guys can look it up on YouTube. And suddenly all the trees start snapping in the distance. And I'm like, oh, my God, the tornado's about to hit us. Dave gets in the Hyundai. I just keep standing there. And I start getting blasted by corn stalks and sand that hurt. Like, it felt like all my skin was coming off. <laughs> so, naturally, I jump underneath the Hyundai exit. <laughs> so, I intercepted my first tornado underneath Dave's Hyundai. But, but Kevin, how did you, based on those you know, pitfalls, and, I mean, it was the best season we ever had in 2009, in my opinion, one of the most enjoyable with the intercepting. I think it – it proved that your design worked, but what'd you do to improve on those with uh, with Dominator One, and then eventually Do- we'll we'll talk about the Minnesota story, and then we'll have Joel come in and tell that one. And uh, yeah, how'd, how'd you improve it? Well, I, I got to be honest with you. I really, when we were building Dominator One, I I I remember telling Benny uh, <laughs> we were about halfway through the build. I said, "What is?" what's the chance of him really driving this into a tornado? I mean, honestly, how is he going to get it into a tornado? And I had obviously never been storm chasing at that point. And um, so I had no idea really what kind of uh, extreme weather was out there. And uh, so we looked at it like, okay, we just need to, you know, make it aerodynamic, make it uh, deflect the wind. 
and yeah, I didn't I didn't design for it to run into a production vehicle or to you know <laughs> do a few things like that. But um, the back of the vehicle, we we left uh, the actual hatch, uh, just like the Tahoe had. We just armored over the top of it, and it still mm-hmm. opened. And it was a real weak point of the vehicle, and and a and a non aerodynamic point of the vehicle. Um, and it was an area that was impossible to armor with roll cage of any strength because we needed to keep it light for the tailgate to still open. Mm-hmm. And, and we were vulnerable we from a from a hindwind. I mean, from a backwind, we were vulnerable because we just had oh, that yeah, flat definitely. plate. So it helped a lot by making our aerodynamic. Yeah, and we we uh, left that tailgate the way it was because you had that big weather probe that you were. Uh, still trying to use in 2009 that that camera probe. Which big Anamop. weather probe? Which big weather probe are you talking about? That that <laughs> big, the probe that you used in 2008 that you got into the tornado with, and we had to May build it. Oh, I, I've got a, I've got the big weather probe right here. No, yeah. I'm just right. <laughs> oh, geez. Here we go down another path. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so anyhow, that's why we left the tailgate. Uh, the way it was, our initial thought was to cut the back of the vehicle and angle it like the front, um, create the same type of aerodynamics from the rear as, as we did the front, because you never know which direction a tornado is going to hit you from. Um, as, as much as you can plan, you can try to drive, put the nose into the tornado, but it still hits you from all directions. And uh, yeah, Especially strong so tornadoes. That, that, that probably motivated the, the cutting of the back and actually really putting a lot stronger roll cage in the rear. Um, the automatic window lift system. It. Yeah, it wanted to automate the window lift system, so it yeah. take user error out of it because that was my fault that the windows weren't up. Because Chris Whiteneck in the back seat on the June 17 tornado, I mean Whiteneck had his uh, he rolled up his Lexan and his is the only window that didn't bust out on that downwind mm-hmm. side. And I remember at the end of the show we'd always somehow get lucky and finish out with you know the finale of all finales, especially that you know the year before we had the backup moment that I'll never live down. When I was curled up in the fetal position watching it on Discovery, I mean, that's so embarrassing. I looked like Wolfman. And in my mind, I remember talking in an inside voice. That's what I remember, and I watched it on TV, and I'm like a spaz. And it was like, back up, car two, back up. You know, it's never quite as intense. I'm, I am a spaz, you know, in moments, but I mean, not quite that bad of a spaz. Oh, you're, right, Joel? You're more of a freak, I think. Freak. Storm freak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, the, yeah, we had the automatic window lift system, and... Uh, now we're going to have Joel uh, sit in here and tell about the EF4 intercept. Uh, Joel, you want to? What day was that? That uh, was on June uh, 17th. Also June 17, 2010, the year later. And this is probably the second most worried that I was. Maybe the most worried, uh, but this is when Joel yelled at me, Reed, it's not a game. All we'll dramatic like. <laughs> so here comes Joel Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> He's back. This is a new Joel. 245 pounds, six foot seven. It's bigger than uh, the seat. It's bigger than Blake Bell, the Bell Dozer, uh, University of Oklahoma uh, quarterback of the future. It's going to win three national titles coming up here. But it's a Joel Taylor. Goes. And Joel, of course, is still on the TVN team. He's coming back in 2013 stronger than ever. Uh, Dominator one, Dominator two, Dominator three, or his own vehicle. Who knows? But Joel's never left the team. He's been there since the beginning. I think we've. Always done this for what the last ten years. Yeah, I'll yeah. chase with you for a while, then screw you. I'm gonna go do my own thing. Well, I remember that uh, <laughs> we were playing like those home poker tournaments, and that one time I wanted to go to South Dakota and you didn't. <laughs> that was it. And we've we've got had the ups and downs, ridges and troughs, but you know Joel and I uh, always been friends with Chase since 2001, 2000. I think 2000, 2001 was the first chase together. Both chased the uh, May 3rd, 1999 tornado, and. Uh, yeah, we're thinking either having Joel drive Dominator 3, Dick drive Dominator 2, and uh, the goal for this year is to surround the tornado with uh, multiple Dominators intercepting, shooting radars into the, or uh, shooting uh, rockets into the tornadoes, having, you know, three radars to triangulate. Uh, but your first you know, real big intercept, we had the Bottle Tornado, but the Minnesota one on June 17, 2010, uh, you know, it was your first rodeo. Uh, <laughs> tell us about it, buddy. That was pretty crazy because I mean, we had a couple of tornadoes early on that we were able to get inside, but they were on the weaker, weaker variety. And then we looked to the west, and there was what probably a mile wide wedge tornado on the ground. Yeah, EF4. EF4 moving right at us, and you know it was one of those things where you knew you were going to get the chance 
to actually get inside that. And that's when I get nervous. Seeing a tornado on the ground doesn't bother me, but when I know we're going to have the chance to drive in and you, you actually have to execute at that point, that's when it you know kind of becomes real. So um, it hasn't become real yet. <laughs> still on a touch of that. <laughs> but like, yeah, I just remember it, it happened so quick. I mean, during the, the heat of the moment, it seemed like it took forever. But now it's just kind of a, a a quick memory. But I just remember sitting there with it hitting us just full fury, and I had my. Oh, I remember foot. I wanted to go north and then get in front of it and get in the weak side, you know, go cut in front of this mile wide wedge, yeah. and then Joel, we had this huge argument, you know, <laughs> what do we do? And then the tiv blows by us, remember? The tiv? Yeah. I was like, Joel, come on, we can't beat us. And suddenly I see Joel's eyes get in, more intense than I've ever seen. <laughs> Testosterone kicked in. He did not want to lose. And uh, boom, we go right to the right side of that tornado. Remember the barn that blew up to the left? Yeah, it was a crazy, crazy few minutes. I, I remember I had my foot pressed as hard as I could on the brake. I had pulled the emergency brake. We had lowered down, and we're still scooting. I mean, the wind was so strong, it was scooting us across the ground. And you remember seeing the and anemometer get ripped off as we saw oh, the yeah, arm. It went flying off to the north, and I, your eyes were huge during that that little incident naturally yeah <laughs> it's, it's one of those things i mean especially with a tornado that big and that strong you don't know you don't know what's going to happen i mean yeah i mean we're, the vehicle's obviously built for that but still it's it's you're somewhere where sane people don't go on purpose so and the thing with like a, a rope tornado like the wyoming one you know you get a lot of shear across the vehicle and it's quick but when you're in a wedge like that one i mean it seems like we were in there for 45 minutes yeah it seemed forever the barn blew up to our left and it seemed like the tornado kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and when the rm young our anemometer ripped off and i saw it get sucked into the tornado i was like well there goes our horizontal wind measurement <laughs> but the radar ended up measuring 175 mile per hour wind in the vertical which i know was the first time you know we had a radar inside the uh, window blowout tornado too but that's the first time a mobile radar has ever been inside of a tornado and i was so obsessed with the data but I remember wanting to go north and get in front of it, and I remember Joel looking at me like, basically shut me down. He's like, Great, this is not a game. And after that, I was like, <laughs> it's, uh, Yeah, I always felt, you know, if you keep it in front of you, you can kind of control what's going on if we got in front of it and just, yeah. I don't know. That, that made me more nervous than, than, you know, we were still in control of the situation where we were. If we got in front of it and it's hitting us full brunt, I mean, you just don't know what's... I mean, that that just makes it worse to Did me. the producers feed you that line, it's not a game? Because that's something that just doesn't... No. I've I, 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 you, no. been thinking about saying That's that probably one that I'd, I'd come up with during the course of the downtime, down so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that tornado sliding across the ground, you know, was another time I thought we were worried, and that motivated improvements in the vehicle and uh but we kept chasing you remember uh we chased that tornado at weekend and then we went to wadena minnesota which got hit later on and we're getting gas yeah and people are coming up getting autographs we're like listen there's another supercell coming up from the south you guys need to take cover immediately and we're trying we're saying this is serious you know because they stopped sounding the sirens because it was like one supercell week and then another one came up yeah then we went east of wadena and i remember I remember seeing that wedge touchdown. We called nine one one, and we're on the phone with the people that sound the sirens. I'm like, "Listen, this is a tornado. It's going to be in your town in five minutes. You guys got to sound the sirens." They didn't sound the sirens. And I called back a second time, sound the sirens. You know, we're standing there, still didn't hear them. Called a third time, and then boom, you hear those sirens go off, and a sense of relief, you know, because you know people are taking cover, and nobody lost their lives in the Wadena tornado, and that's. Yeah. How storm chasers helped directly. And that one wrapped up in rain really quick. Remember, we could only see it for maybe 30 seconds to a minute before it got completely wrapped in rain. So the people in Wadena, if they were standing outside looking to the south or southwest, all they're going to see is rain bands coming yeah. in. The tornado was hidden back up, back in there. So, you, guys, you know, it was a really dangerous situation. You guys remember when uh, uh, those people were following us in Wadena? We kept telling them to take cover, and they remember they were just, like, laughing and stuff. Yeah, uh, I mean, people, sometimes they don't take severe weather seriously when they should. Yeah. Yeah. And hey, I'm going to take a step out and let Dick take my seat, and he's going to talk about the Tipton Intercept, the EF4. That, that, that Joel, Joel, Joel says uh, Dick didn't get inside. I think he did. Uh, but then we'll segue that into June 20th, and Dick can tell the story about the production vehicle getting stuck in the mud, how Joel thinks that Dick blocked him in, and then that'll segue into the, the craziest intercept. It, uh, it makes the window blowout scene seem like summer camp, but it was never caught on film. Kevin uh, was in Dominator 1 following behind us. The guy, the Dominator got hit by a horse. 
it flying through the air, and that's no joke. That's not a lie. I confirm that. Uh, but here's pass over to Dick, and uh, we'll let uh, Dick and Joel go at it here. This should be fun, guys. <laughs> so we're talking about the tornado that didn't not that didn't knock down the power lines. <laughs> All right. So let's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I've been meaning to talk about this for a while. Uh, there's a to- uh, back on November seventh, two thousand eleven. It's about a year and a few months ago. Uh, there was a tornado rated an EF four, and uh, Joel actually saw it from a distance. Didn't you see that from a distance? Yeah. And you didn't get there in time, did you? Um, I saw the tornado earlier in the day. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to get on little, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right by your I house. I think I was the only one that saw that first one. That little tiny little. Yeah. Was that was the fake, I think fake that was tornado. Joel, Joel made it Microsoft. Paint. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that makes it work. It's still not in the reports, as far as I know. So it's so it's let's my it, it, here's the thing. That day we were chasing and we were on the storm before that, and then I saw this other uh, storm firing up uh, near the uh, Red River, and these guys are sitting over here playing with their helicopters. I'm like, you guys want to play with your helicopters? You guys want to, you know, go see a tornado? So we got jump in, and the entire time. Uh, I'm like, Reed, is there one on the ground? Is there one on the ground? He's like, no, 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 there's not. And the entire time, he knew there was one on the ground being reported, but he never said anything to me. <laughs> he didn't want anybody to panic. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, are you serious? You know. That's so we, one thing you got to learn with Reed. you got to read his eyes. Yeah. you so, got to watch what he does with the laptop. If he turns it away yeah, from you, he turn it there's, away. Some, there's something. That's exactly what he did. <laughs> he does it all the time. So all we see is this <laughs> hail shaft, you know, and I'm thinking, all right, so let's get through the hail. We're, getting, we're in the city of Tipton, and we're going just east, and I see a couple other chasers and farmers that are pulling over, and I look over to the right, and I'm like, oh, my God, stovepipe. You know, all of a sudden there's this, you know, from the backside at first, you know, it was like a white, this beautiful, it reminded me of that one in uh, Attica, I think it was, in May 12, 2005. This brown dirt underneath it. So I, I overshoot it because I thought it was moving more northeast, but it started uh, going more north. So I, I sh- overshoot it. It's easy to, to do, east. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Joel, Joel knows so well a thing or two about overshooting tornadoes. <laughs> so uh, we get there and we're filming it. It's moving, you know, uh, more northerly. So I was like, we got to go. We, I just floor it and uh, we get right up next to it, probably within. Well, we're in the outer circulation for sure. And Joel says, if you look at the video, it doesn't take down the power lines. <laughs> But if you see the video after that, it, it, the motion on that was, it was like Bodle. It was I'll, like I'll, Bodle. I'll give you outer circulation. Yeah. Quick, I'll, uh, I'll believe outer circulation. You don't have to have condensation to be a tornado. It's just that <laughs> if that was a more moist, low-level environment, the thing would have been a wedge. We would have been it was, show and, and it was rated an EF4, I mean, right near there. I mean, so you can't, you can't agree with that. But uh, actually, our friend, uh, uh, our friend who died in a, a car accident uh, about a year ago, who died from, from a drunk driver hitting him, uh, actually, uh, was trying to out, outrun that tornado and uh, uh, hit like a mud hole and flipped his car. So we had to help him so he couldn't see the, you know, the next beautiful, uh, I think it was near Manitou. Yeah. Manitou tornado. You probably saw that one up close, didn't you? With your, who were you chasing with? That I chased with my dad that day. Yeah, yeah, I, was... love, I love your dad. So cool. <laughs> Jimmy Taylor. Jimmy Joel. Taylor. He, has, he was good luck. Yeah, he has like an 80, 80% success rate. I know. He goes out. <laughs> or not the uh, Wakita day, remember? He almost got hit by uh, yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Near, yeah, near that first yeah, he time. loves to go. So, yeah. and then he's got friends that, you know, they're yeah. always trying to get a ride. So, <laughs> so Joel, tell us about overshooting. Yeah, uh, Joel. Tell I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Dick mentioned uh, overshooting, and it, it's really easy to do actually because <laughs> tornadoes, you know, they're fifty or hundred yards wide, and they're not moving in a straight line. So, we're talking what June twentieth, two thousand eleven. Eleven now. North. north Northwest of Ravenna, Nebraska. Yeah, up in Nebraska. It was our last chase uh, with Discovery that year. I guess our last chase ever with Discovery. And um, you know, there was a beautiful stovepipe tornado down to the south. Um, there was we were come, we come up on this hill, but there's trees on top of the hill. And the next option was a mud. minimum. It said minimal maintenance. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go at your own risk. It was a mud road, <laughs> but we had to go down that mud road a little ways just to be able to see the tornado. And we yeah. first we first came out from behind the trees. It looked like the tornado was still going to go to our west. They were going to have to go down the hill. And I mean, and Kevin was Kevin over here was uh, behind us in Dom One. Yeah, about three cars behind us probably. Yeah, he was behind. So the tornado was probably two miles to our south. It looks like it's still going to go to our west. Um, that was a steep hill going down, yeah. and I knew, you know, if we went down, we were going to be stuck. Yeah, so it was a waterfall. Did, didn't try, did wasn't quite ready to commit, but then, you know, when the tornado was just a mile to our south, it kind of turned back to the east. And uh, and then Kevin, Kevin, tell us what happened here. <laughs> well, we actually pulled up in Dom 1. We were trying to stay really close, 
Uh, who are you with? Us. We could to Dom 2 because we had the radio tracking antenna for the probes on top of Dom 1. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to uh, be just, we didn't want to get hit by the tornado. We just wanted to be outside. It was uh, myself and uh, Gerald from uh, Hyperion was riding in the front seat. And he was monitoring the, uh, the probes that Dom 2 had in the air cannons. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started pulling up on that mud road. Well, Dominator 1 at the time had a little problem with the front end. It didn't have, it didn't go into four-wheel drive very good. It would go in, but it took it a while. And I thought, man, I really don't want to get on that road and get stuck. So yeah. I pulled down at about 100 feet, and I thought, no, this is way too muddy. I'm going to back up, and we're going to wait it out in this driveway of this house. Well, it was a beautiful house, and uh, it had a big, like, four-stall garage, really fancy garage, and uh I thought, well, this driveway is as good a place as any. So I pulled up in front of the driveway, was watching this beautiful stovepipe white tornado, just beautiful white tornado in it. And it was moving from our left to right across in front of us. So I thought we were in perfect position. Uh, and I really thought it was going to hit Dom 2 directly. It, lo it looked perfect. And then it just stopped. Yeah, at the and last second it just... <laughs> I said, well, tornadoes don't stop. <laughs> it's got to be either heading away from us or heading toward us. And, and it just kept getting bigger, and it's like, okay, it's heading right for us. So we backed up about maybe 100 feet or so, and I thought I backed up enough where it was going to pass in front of us. And it just kept turning. And by that time, you know, I thought, well, I'll back up a little bit more. But then the outer circulation was already hitting us a little bit, so I, I decided to just lower the hydraulics and, and hunker down. We had no time to get the outer windows up, uh, which, of course, inspired some more changes to the um, <laughs> window design but uh, I remember ducking down and I was holding my video camera over my head because mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to just capture something but I I knew I had to duck my head down because I, I had a feeling the windows were going to go and uh, I had both feet on the brake just as hard as I could push them uh, head buried into the steering wheel and then I had you know one hand up over my head with the video camera like this well my battery my video camera is just about dead and it went dead right about uh, a split second after the window, the first window blew out. Uh, but I, I remember seeing the glass fly across the dashboard. And I thought, well, okay, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I, I was, Gerald was in that seat, and he was, he was in the passenger seat, and that was the first window that went. And I just heard him over there going, ow, 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 you know, and I thought, oh, man, he's getting cut up, you know, I was freaking out. And but he wasn't like, you know, I kept going, you're all right, you're all right, you know, and he's going, ow, ow, ow. <laughs> well, then it was just shaking the car. I mean, it was shaking it so hard. I, I really thought we were going to get blown. We were going to get blown off the road. And um, <laughs> I remember the second window blowing out, I actually felt it hit the back of my head. Yeah, just glass covering me, you know. Mm -hmm. And then it just went calm. And we picked our heads up and we were right in the center of it and it just it died for just a second right in the core of it which was incredible ears were popped and just yeah nuts. It, it got stronger after it, uh after you guys uh intercepted right there i remember seeing how how much wider that thing got as it yeah went. it was it was growing rapidly and then i said oh it's not over and we ducked back down and it started shaking the vehicle again and then i felt two really big uh one had to be a tree because it jarred the car really hard and then another huge hit you can just feel the car get pushed by a large piece of debris and then i never i never even felt the third window blow out but, uh, it did but the driver's window my driver's window was the only one that didn't blow so i was actually fortunate there but really uh, wow as soon as it passed it was like you know you're like catching your breath for a second and rain was starting to come in and <laughs> It just all happened so fast. Yeah, exactly. And I'm, I'm looking around. I looked at Gerald. I said, you okay? And, I, you know, he looked up at me, and he was just, like, dazed. And I'm like, <laughs> I thought he was hurt. I didn't see any blood or anything. So he's like, no, I think I'm fine, you know. So I said, well, I got to I gotta get out and roll up these back windows because uh, the rain was just gushing in. We had equipment in there. and So I tried to open my door, and I couldn't open my door. I'm like, oh, I'm I'm still deployed. I'm still down. The hydraulics are still down. So raise them up, and I tried to open my door. I still couldn't open my door. I was like, well, something's wrong. So I, I started to drive forward, and I drove forward probably 15 feet or so, and then tried my door, and it opened right up. And I'm like, oh, wow. 
got out, looked back, and there was a horse that was up against my door, basically, of the of the Dominator. And that was probably that large piece of debris that we yeah. felt hit. Um, so here laid this horse in the road dead. That was that was kind of poor horse. Uh, yeah, it was a little freaky. And then we looked up, and the in the garage that was up there was just completely gone. It was it was nothing but a slab left. Yeah, yeah um, there was a house, a really nice house up there. They got very yeah, lucky. It missed it missed my feet. Yeah, <laughs> really a bad situation. The tours actually got some great video of that. They stayed back a little bit further as it crossed the road there. I remember. Uh, one of the uh, member, one of the guests on there got uh, some great video of that tornado. Yeah, so. they, they weren't that far behind us, really. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, they watched us go up over that hill, and they stayed back. And it's a good thing they did because yeah, they got good video of it crossing the road right there. They. Yeah, we actually had uh, two other vehicles, uh, two other uh, chasers that were parked right next to me, basically, and they they got out of there just in time. Johnny and uh, Todd both got out of there, literally maybe 10 seconds before that thing hit us yeah uh, i'm a little envious that you got were able to get in that position kevin because we we had gone down that road and uh the, the mud road and when we realized that it was actually going to pass just to our east i was trying to back up and dick had uh, gotten his follow vehicle stuck <laughs> in the mud right behind us and, and i was able to get the momentum if 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 he hadn't been in the way i really think well, i could have yeah. pulled it out and gotten back on the pavement <laughs> I'd been in position, but <laughs> no, uh, no, no, Joel's got it all wrong. I got <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. This, this position as an unbiased perspective. Uh, <clears throat> I think that we were stuck in the mud anyway, but the position of the follow vehicle didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> back up, back up. Like, I no, can't. <laughs> but I remember uh, Chris Whiteneck and all the production guys. They thought they were in the path of the tornado, <laughs> and they abandoned the vehicle. So they abandoned the Why vehicle. Like, uh, they're in the ditch. Whitenecks like, hit the freaking deck, and then uh, Simone, uh, our uh, our shooter, uh, he jumped out of the car and took off running. <laughs> 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 he felt more comfortable on foot. Than the top. <laughs> Funny thing is, is we come up to the Dominator. You know, we saw the horse there. Uh, and we lifted it up, and it worked. I mean, it was like suction. It was like all dry road lifted up. And the road all around the Dominator was scoured away. And on the floorboard of the passenger seat was a high school football photo from Ravenna High School that came from the house that got hit. And we you know, went up and helped them you know, clean up their, their whole entire garage, uh, which wasn't a garage. This thing was like bigger than was, my house. It was, a, it was like a, it was a barn, like a storage barn. Yeah, a barn, yeah. And uh, storage barn. And, um, yeah, so we brought back this high school football photo to the family's mom, and she was crying when we brought it to her. And, like, <laughs> uh, the whole community came together, and we helped clean up all the mess from the barn. And the crazy thing is is this whole barn was destroyed. A horse was carried out of it. Uh, you know, the whole dominator was blasted by trees, windows blown out. But everything, the only thing that were sitting there were all these Harleys that the guy had just all lined up just – not destroyed at all without a scratch, which is the weirdest thing. And then, uh, and then Terry came to the rescue. Like, Terry has a uh, 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 he can't see very well, and he actually got uh, he got us on he got us unstuck. We were stuck there for like two or three hours. Yeah, we was, could we could have kept job. chasing. We could have blasted east and then saw the uh, no, Aurora tornado. That's and, what the tour said. They couldn't do it. Couldn't oh, we could have done it. <laughs> Team Dominator. Team Dominator. We could have fired up the teleport device. We got this new piece of equipment <laughs> called the TVN Teleport that we'll be deploying this year. And, uh, <laughs> but now, uh, uh, so all, the, all those stories, you know, kind of culminate. 2012, uh, Storm Chasers was canceled. We uh, put every resource into our online series, Tornado Chasers, which I recommend everybody check it out. We got episodes 1 through 12 on tor- uh, tvnweather.com slash on demand. Uh, we're going to keep pumping those out year-round. We've got more series planned. And uh, that's our 2012 season with Dominator 1, Dominator 2. Dominator 2 broke down. We were in a Tahoe, had the windows blown out again. We drew blood for a second time, if you want to see the season finale. Uh, But now for the future, for 2013, we're building Dominator 3. Uh, That's what Kevin and uh, the build team has going on behind them there. And uh, Kevin, how about you talk about Dominator 3? We're partnering with TVN Canada chaser Sean Schofer out of Melville, Saskatchewan, that we met from chasing in Canada so much this year. Uh, Sean uh, is helping us get this thing off the ground. Uh, He's working with Kevin on building the Dominator 3. Uh, And this thing is not only for research and intercepting tornadoes, but 
we're also rigging it out to be a, a first responder vehicle. And Sean being a firefighter with first responder training, uh, he's, he's basically the missing piece of the puzzle that we need. So when we arrive on these damage paths, uh, he can help, you know, treat injuries. I remember the Yazoo City event, Joel, and we saw those crazy injuries that we weren't, you know, hand uh, equipped or had, yeah. the, you know, the training to, to handle. And, and we can be there. I mean, we're there right after the tornado, and sometimes it takes EMS, you know, a, a few minutes at least to get remember, everybody in position. I mean, we saw, we saw some horrible things in there. Yeah. We helped an elderly couple out of a house. Uh, you know, we were just walking through there with sandals. There were, uh, you know, people coming at us that, and they look to you. It's such a helpless feeling when these people are looking into your eyes and they need you to help them, but you aren't equipped to help their injuries. And you know, I remember coming up to a pickup truck and there was a woman in the back of the pickup truck with a, clearly a broken hip and she was just giggling and like stuff like that. And then we found Lee Woods, uh, who was you know, in the rubble of a mobile home and we thought the worst case scenario had happened. But uh, you know, thankfully we ran and found somebody with a stretcher and uh, rolled him onto a stretcher. We carried him a couple miles to an ATV and uh, drove the ATV and airlifted him out of there. Potentially saved his life. Did save his life. Um, you know he's paralyzed uh, from the waist down, but there's a good chance he'll walk again. And uh, we keep in contact with Lee. He's building supercomputers now, and we bought his community a tornado shelter. And this last tornado warning that they had that went through, they had 16 people inside that tornado shelter. Wow. And uh, I actually did that without telling anybody. <laughs> I got the tornado shelter for him. Yeah. And, it's, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it just feels really good to help out that way. And Seems like Yazoo City has a lot of tornado warnings. They do. they got a lot down there. And if anybody needs a tornado shelter, it's Yazoo City. And, yeah, it's getting put to good use. And But now with this new Dominator 3, it's like a search and rescue vehicle and a research vehicle combined. And it's going to be the ultimate storm chasing machine. So, Kevin, tell us what... Yeah, plan with Dominator 3, and uh, if you're on schedule, like when do you think it's going to be completed, and uh, what's going on over there? I know you've, you're you running a restaurant, you're trying to make ends meet, uh, you're running a tour company, uh, you've built a Dominator 3. I mean, I would say you're a renaissance man. you got uh, MacGyver sitting back there behind you, Rob Barton. Uh, you've got uh, Benny, Ben Christie there. He's got the muscle. And are you still pumping iron, Benny? Uh, not as much, but I still do. <laughs> Yeah, I thought I saw Benny the other day. I thought he was juicing, but uh, it's all natural. Just I, I'm one of those people that was born naturally weak. Uh, I didn't go through puberty until about 25 years old, and uh, you know I've always kind of had an insecurity complex. I was always the smallest guy in class, 110 pounds with a bowling ball head, and then uh, just try to make my body match my head, and that's been pretty much my life's mission, other than storm chasing. But maybe Joel and Benny can. <laughs> who, do you, who, do you, who do you think stronger brute force strength, uh, Benny or Joel right now? I mean, Joel, you know, he's obviously... Uh, Joel, Joel would break Benny in half. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think, you know, I, I think Benny's got that, he's got the strength, you know, to like lift things and throw people, whereas Joel's going more for the looks. So, uh, we'd let, and Joel's top heavy too. I've taken Joel down a few times before he started pumping iron. That's now, what six, seven does. Right now, if Joel came at me, uh, I would run. Uh, full speed <laughs> that's typically what i do I don't, I don't have any fighting skills whatsoever so i run <laughs> but i saw I'm benny go out on a limb here and say that joel could probably catch you benny uh, did protect me one time uh yeah i was up in northern michigan and uh this guy was you know kind of mouthed it off a little bit i saw this is when benny was at his peak and he just grabbed the guy and just boom just threw his head against the wall to the guy <laughs> Wouldn't bother us anymore. <laughs> so Benny, yeah, thanks, Benny, for that. Yeah, that's great. Now you just gave that guy his name. Yeah. <laughs> I bet he's never, he probably never ran his mouth again after that, though. So, I mean, he helped him out. You know, he just kind of taught him a lesson. And, yeah, he didn't hurt him too bad. He didn't hurt him at all. He just kind of said, hey, you know, I'm Benny, and uh, I'm powerful. Oh, boy. <laughs> Looks like the Dominator uh, car alarm's going off in the garage. The homeowner association is not going to be too happy about that. Right now, Dominator 1, though, is actually broken down in my driveway, and I got a letter from the homeowner association that said, you know, is our agreement broken? And <laughs> it's like just sitting there, this 8,000-pound tank in the driveway, and I was like, hey, you can move it, you know, help me <laughs> out. But I've got until the end of the week to get it out of there. But, yeah, anyway, sorry, I tend to go on tangents. So, Kevin, tell us about Dominator 3. <laughs> well, just... Just starting off with, you know, Dominator 1, we really had no idea what we were doing. Um, but I, I can honestly say that because we had never been storm chasing. 
Um, after chasing with Dom 1, we built Dom 2. We said, this is going to be the ultimate vehicle, you know. Uh, with Dom 2, of course, we didn't have enough time to build it. Um, we didn't get started on it until February. We got forced into service uh, May 15th. And again, we felt like we had more ideas and we had uh, we had better quality in us that we could have we could have built if we had a little more time. So it's kind of nice with Down Near Three here, where we actually got an earlier start. Um, we have uh, the vehicle. We got the vehicle right away. Uh, a brand new uh, 2012 Ford F350 uh, crew cab. Wonderful truck. I mean, it's just an incredible truck and. Uh, Starting with a, with a brand new heavy duty vehicle like this, and, th and this thing's built to carry the kind of weight that we're putting together. Um, so this one's going to be just going down the road and everything. It's going to be a, a vehicle that's actually built tough enough to handle what we're going to do with it. And so we're starting with a better product. I really believe. I mean, not that not that uh, Dominator one or two are, are bad. It's just that we had to do quite a bit of modification to make them handle the weight. This vehicle is already equipped to do that, uh, so that's a nice start. Um, yeah, and it saved us a lot of time too. Uh, rather than hydraulics on this vehicle, we did opt for a custom airbag system because there was one manufactured for this vehicle that works really well for what we're uh, what we want to do. So that was a huge time savings as well. Uh, what we're hoping to do is put this vehicle together as quickly as possible with. Uh, the things that used to take us a lot of time, like the hydraulics on Dom 2 took us a good four to five weeks to engineer and build because it's a custom system we built ourselves. This one here we ordered, um, we got it in, we've we've got it most of the way installed already in just a few days. So that'll save us a, enough time where we can actually work on the details of this vehicle and, and hopefully we can have a better research. Uh, we can come up with more gizmos and gadgets to fire rockets and probes and uh, do the things that we really wanted to do with Dom 2. Um, so a lot heavier duty vehicle and it's and it's going to be far safer as well. Um, more powerful. It's got it's got a diesel, turbo diesel, uh, tons of horsepower, you know, just plenty of uh, we're enlarging the fuel tank in it, uh, putting a larger fuel tank. It's going to have a range of close to 1,000 miles on a tank of fuel, um, which wow. is pretty incredible. And so that'll be only, uh, uh, only about 80 tanks of fuel then if we have a season like 2012. That's not bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we figured with chasing in Canada as well, you know, uh, this thing's going to spend a fair amount of time up in Canada. Yeah. And the, the gas stations are a little more scarce up there, but the, the stations with diesel are far more scarce. Yeah, well, the thing about Canada, too, is it's extremely active about every three or four years. <clears throat> and, you know, 2006 is a season that I remember that was just like 2013. And uh, we've always got to be prepared to go to Canada. We'd like to chase the high plains of Alberta a lot more and maybe ship this thing to Argentina, maybe Bangladesh, and uh, Australia. Who knows? Uh, we're also, uh, some new projects that we're going to be doing, too, is uh, intercepting water spouts. So we're going to have jet skis that are specifically designed <laughs> to shoot probes into water spouts to assess, you know, the pressure falls and the differences in the dynamics between water spouts and real tornadoes. And the goal, ultimate goal, you know, for you know, who knows how long this is going to take, but is to have a tornado surrounded by three dominators from close range with high resolution radar uh, and try to you know, better understand the complex dynamics and those suction vortices and uh, be the first to measure one of those five or six hundred mile per hour winds, and whether we're the first or not, who knows? But as long as you know, science is a collaborative effort, so it really doesn't matter who measures it. But I know they're there, and that data can be used by structural engineers to help better build homes to withstand tornadoes. And Joel, being in the real estate business, I mean, you can verify that my house here is probably it's built by cardboard, wouldn't you say? Yeah, right. these were all these are all cookie cutter homes, so they're thrown together. Yeah, I mean, when a northerly wind happens in the south, I feel like I'm in a Cat 5 hurricane or a tornado intercept in the Dominator. So it would be it would be awesome to be able to get that radar, the radar data right up next close to a tornado. Like with the Dow, I mean, they're kind of doing the same thing, but they're two, three miles away. So what they're measuring is actually two or 300 feet off the ground. Yeah. And what we could do is be able to measure from, you know, within 50 yards of the tornado and get the ground-specific measurements for wind speeds. And another thing we'd like to do, too, is get 
The Dominator's inside an eye wall of a Category 4, Category 5 hurricane and measure those tornado-like vortices that spin around the inside. And we know Joel doesn't chase Cat 3 or lower. Like, <laughs> he takes like a squall line for 12 hours. Without lightning. <laughs> but, I mean, Hurricane Isaac, you know, we're living in a parking garage, you know, living off of moon pies with wild boars and snakes everywhere. I mean, What do Joel, you prefer, moon pies or Vienna sausage? Moon pies. I would never eat a Vienna sausage, even in a survival situation. I would uh, I'd start foraging for roots. <laughs> Something, but yeah, it, yeah, Joel, <laughs> you would not have been happy in that parking garage. Uh, we had a, uh, we, Reed and I chased Hurricane, was it John, back in like 2006. So we went in Baja, Mexico? Yeah, down to yeah. Cabo San Lucas. And uh, like, I, we left about three hours, the, the flight left about three hours after we decided we were going to go, and Reed told me to just go buy supplies. And I bought like three boxes worth of Vienna sausages, and that's what we loaded up and took with us. Um, <laughs> but Reed, yeah, that was... And then it, it pretty much missed us. I think we had 35 mile an hour winds where we were at. Uh, we chased yeah, it. We, we chased it to the east and up the up the peninsula, and it was actually pretty intense. We almost got trapped by a mudslide. Oh, we, we paid a, it. We paid the guy $200. Uh, this guy that had this SUV that had the biggest base system I've ever heard, and he's driving east out of Cabo on these cliffs where I was looking down the right side, and it was like a 2,000 foot drop straight to the ocean with mudslides coming down. And this guy is playing bass like old gangster rap like intense base and we tried to come back remember and then the mudslides blocked us from getting to the hotel and the yeah. military was threatening to go put us in an underground shelter we had they we had to what well, we rode a bulldozer across like all this rushing water was coming across the road and we were on a bulldozer that's pretty crazy <laughs> they pulled, pulled a vehicle across and then we chased hurricane dean which is another kind of funny story but uh in itself but, yeah we'll save that one for another podcast yeah. what, else, what else did we chase uh, all kinds Francis. Of stuff. Francis, yeah. Uh, Chase Hurricane Francis, or Hurricane Floyd. Uh, it was more in 2004, too. Uh, well, Francis, we slept in a rental car for five days with Simon Brewer of Storm it Riders. It smelled the so bad there. Well, what if we got done? But you don't notice the smell. And funny, <laughs> this is the last funny story before we get to the end of this. But we're trying to sleep in this car. There's power flashes everywhere. And there was this pop can, beer can. I don't know what it was. But the thing kept blowing around in a circle. Like this eddy, but the eddy was, it would go all the way out to the end of the parking lot and come all the way back, go under our vehicle, and then back again. And the, the ding, 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 of this like can going all around in a circle, it was impossible to sleep, but everyone was too tired to get the can, and you couldn't even find it. And that pop can kept me awake the whole entire night anyway. I mean, you can't sleep in a hurricane. And uh, that Hurricane Francis stalled offshore, and we were waiting for that thing and waiting for that thing, and uh, yeah. Oops. Well, anywho, uh, yeah. So I got another got some question and answer session here now on Twitter. Um, here we go. Let's see. What what do we forecast the 2013 season to be like? And then we'll uh, we'll take it off air after this. And uh, next week we'll bring you a uh, a new podcast with multiple guests. Uh, we got some heavy hitters coming in. We'll that uh, we'll leave that to surprise, but. For 2013, I think there's a there's a strong subtropical jet stream. Reminds me a lot of 2007. Remember when we chased and we had uh, March 24th, we saw March 23rd, or 3rd, we saw the tornado in eastern New Mexico near Tatum. We had March 28th, 2007, in the Texas Panhandle. We had Tulia. The Southern Plains were very active early on because you had so much moisture transport. And you'll notice this winter the Gulf's not getting cleared out. I mean, you're getting tropical moisture up to Evansville, Indiana. They had a tornado a couple days ago. And uh, I think that 2013 is going to be extremely active in the Southern Plains early on, probably March, April, May. Uh, we'll be out there in full force, and then it'll probably die down a little bit. And uh, in 2007, that was when we saw our first Canada tornado, and I think it was uh, also the year that there was the F5 up in Canada near Eli, Manitoba. And we could have seen both of those, but, yeah, that was the, uh, the uh, first First time we saw the Canada tornado. Also in the Hyundai accent, too, is that big bright white tornado. And uh, some other questions. Um, is there anything in Storm Chasers that was fabricated in uh, on Discovery Channel? Um, no, uh, I will say uh, unofficially. <laughs> but <laughs> all the storm chase, I mean, everything's real. All the storm chasing and all that is 100% real. Uh, every now and then, though, you know, our camera guys. 
uh, weren't set up all the time. So we'd have to walk out of the hotel over and over and over <laughs> again. And those were so awkward. That think, shows you how bad of actors we are. Yeah, I think the, the intense scenes were, you know, the stuff with tornadoes, all that was real time because you, you can't recreate that. I mean, there was probably some background stuff that, I mean, if you'll watch, especially the first couple seasons, uh, you know, we'll be walking into the house wearing one shirt and walking out wearing a different shirt. So, <laughs> you know, just little stuff like that that really didn't necessarily affect the the flow of the show or anything. So while we'd walk out with a different shirt, though, I'd end up wearing the same pair of underwear for like four <laughs> weeks because I'd pack for one day and we'd be on the road for, oh, you know, four weeks, maybe yeah. longer. That's something I would highly recommend against if you do care about you know, your own hygiene. Uh, a lot of times when I storm chase, I don't. Uh, I know you guys don't over there, definitely. Kevin, uh, he takes storms way before hygiene. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> But, yeah, you know, Dave Holder just tweeted here, come on, Reed, tornadoes happen every year in Canada. Uh, they do. We just might have to head up to Flin Flon, right? Right, Holder? Uh, you follow him at Titherby, T-Y-T-H-E-R-B-Y, as Dave Holder. Another question. Oh, another yes. Is that, it's coming up this weekend, right? Guys, uh, and to conclude the podcast... Uh, this weekend is the Minnesota Storm Chasing Convention. And um, so the website on that? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. But we'll post about it. On our, you can Google Minnesota Storm Chasing Convention, but I was a speaker there last year. And uh, I'll tell you what, uh, nicest group of people, most passionate storm chasers out there up in Minnesota, nicest guys. Uh, you got uh, you know, all kinds of great chasers up there. Um, and uh, I definitely recommend the Minnesota Storm Chasing Convention. Sean Casey speaking up there. Our own Ken Cole, uh, the editor of uh, Tornado Chasers, our online series will be up there. I can't go up there. Got to save money. I'm back in scrapper mode. Dollar <laughs> menu in the Taco uh, Taco Bell menu. Do you need the job painting? Yeah, I actually, <laughs> Joel actually hired me back in 2006 when I was at a, a rough point. Paid me about six dollars an hour to paint his homes. That lasted one day. <laughs> Shut that down. But <laughs> I, I painted. I, I could lay a good stripe though, right? I think you got one, like one side of the outside of a house done. No, I painted the whole house. Just had to repaint the thing. I think Joel just got more enjoyment out of watching me paint one of his homes. But anyway, guys, thanks a lot. And uh, oh, another tweet here from uh, Braden Morso. You can follow him at Braden, B-R-Y-D-O-N, more so, M-O-R-E-S-O. He uh, loves Flynn Flon. He's uh, going to be a, a streamer for us this year, and he'll be streaming the High Plains of Alberta. That's where he's based out of, out of Cochrane. So uh, thanks, Braden. Also, thanks for the uh, Christmas present. Finally picked it up from the post office today for uh, Holder and I. Uh, we're pretty fired up about that. And uh, one more. Pardon? All right, guys. Anyway, you can watch the archive of this. I mean, it doesn't make sense because you're watching it live. You may, or maybe if you caught the uh, podcast late live, you can watch the archive at tvnweather.com slash podcast. Uh, we're also going to be doing the uh, Extreme Weather Bulletins this week. Uh, we've got a, many more new exciting products that will be launching on tvnweather.com. Uh, we we'll keep you updated on Dominator 3. Stay tuned to our social networks. And uh, we'll end with a phrase that this uh, podcast was named after. And that's three words, Joel. You know what they are? Joel? Never stop chasing. And so, and sometimes Joel will stop chasing, but chasing doesn't always apply to storms. Chase it, the big events. It applies to lots of things. Not only storms, your dreams. Close to home. Passion. You know, sometimes you got to chase real estate. Joel's the, the Donald Trump of Norman uh, for a reason, because he's never stopped, chasing, uh, never stopped chasing deals. And thanks, guys, for having us. Never stop chasing. We did it.